Um, I'd like to introduce Professor Stephen Morris, who's coming over all the way from the University of Toronto. Um, I can say Stephen and I have been working together. I, it's, it's a little bit dodgy how long we've, how long we've been working together, but um, <laughs> we've done well, one particular project, Faraday Waves, which some of you will know about. But, so I first met Stephen around about 15 years ago um, at an art science conference um, in Toronto, and uh, we've been sort of talking about all things Vitruvius and all sorts of things um, ever since. Um, so I've invited Stephen over to talk to you um, about his work uh, within physics, but also within art, and that line, if there is a line, which we hope there isn't, um, between art and science. Stephen. Yes, I've been making it my business to cross that line or erase that line recently. So I'm going to tell you about my, my business, which is what's called pattern formation. Pattern formation is a field of uh, science or applied mathematics or physics or engineering, somewhere in that combination. And I'll, I will try to convince you that there is a thin and possibly invisible line between pattern formation and art. And I will show you the work of uh, outrageous numbers of people, including our local hero, uh, Rob Godman there. Uh, Jimmy LeBlanc is a, another composer. Quinson Nakoff is another composer. Some of those people are graduate students. Some of them are potters. Uh, some of them are uh, artists who I've worked with. This is a picture of an icicle. Um, we do grow icicles professionally in the laboratory. I'll show you how we do that and talk about that toward the end. So what I want to sell you is this kind of simple idea, which is that uh, I'm going to take scientific images, which we produce for the purposes of publishing in the usual scientific journals, and I'm just going to repurpose them as art and get away with it. And uh, I claim, and you can disagree, but I claim that the, the things we do in this field of pattern formation have their own aesthetic appeal, and I can, I can simply repackage them and use them as art. And uh, whenever I'm speaking to art people, I, I basically say this is art. And when I'm speaking to science people who are always a little dodgy and worried about this kind of thing, I use a special word, and that word is outreach. So if, you're, if you say, oh, don't worry, what I'm doing is outreach, then they're, they're okay with that. Because outreach is a, is a kind of license to do anything that isn't really scientific, but it engages the public somehow. And normally when we do outreach, in physics especially, we put on events, and, they, and people bring their kids to them, right? So they're kind of like family entertainment kind of events. And I've discovered that there's another whole shoal of people out there who aren't necessarily small children who are interested in scientific outreach. And so uh, this is a kind of outreach that reaches a different part of the public. It normally happens at science outreach events. So outreach is my, is my kind of shield for when... Uh, you know, my department chair wants to know what I've been spending my time on, I can say outreach. But really the art and the outreach are the same thing. We do exactly the same activities. We just label them differently for different audiences. Um, and I, I reached a certain age in life and I realized that what attracted me to this field in the first place wasn't the sort of pure science of it, it was this. This is, this is the, literally the experiment that I saw in 1990 or so that convinced me that I had to work in this field. Yeah, the reason it looks all blurry and horrible is it was transferred from VHS tape, and it used to be really hard to make this stuff. You had to use you know, cameras attached to microscopes and all that. What you're seeing here is a one millimeter wide liquid crystal film, which is kind of like a soap bubble. It's colored like a soap bubble. And I'm putting a voltage across it from one side to the other. And when you increase the voltage high enough, it begins to do this wild, whirling thing. And you, you can spend all day looking at the kind of psychedelic colors that you can produce by putting voltages across films like this. And this, seeing this, uh, you know, one afternoon in Toronto in 1990 or so, completely transformed my life. I said, I've got to work on this. And I started working on it without telling my thesis advisor that I was working on it. And after several years, it turned into my PhD thesis. And it's basically changed the direction of my research. And I've always worked on visually exciting and interesting and often beautifully colored images ever since. And it's taken me upwards of 20 years to admit that I really just do it because of the look of the thing and not all the equations and the math and the physics and all that. There is all that. I can give you a whole physics lecture about this, but you don't need a physics lecture to appreciate the, the picture. So here, here's, a, um, here's a slightly uh, still picture. So this is uh, the phenomenon known as symmetric electric convection, which I discovered. And it was the subject of my original scientific work back in 1980. I worked on other things before. But I've exhibited pictures of spectric electric convection in an art context. And I claim that the pictures were 
both ways as science and art. And here is a sort of round version of the thing. This is kind of my my logo. I put this on all my my laboratory stuff and my web page and stuff. And it's basically just the same experiment except the voltage between the inside and the outside now. Okay, so I, I thought about this for a while, and I finally come to the conclusion that scientists are actually guilty of producing folk art. They don't know that they're making art, but they are. And there is a, there are scientific folks, I'm one, and we have our own sort of aesthetic language, and we understand each other, but we don't really expect to show it to anybody else, and it's kind of insight. Outsider art, if we show it to somebody else. So there's this idea of outsider art, which is art made by people who are sort of unaware that are making it. You know, scrimshaw, you know, whalers carving whale teeth, uh, producing art. Um, and I claim that this field, especially of pattern formation, um, is an honest scientific field, but secretly it's really driven by an aesthetic sense of to produce beautiful artwork-like things and show them basically to each other. And eventually, what my plan is is to leak that out and show that to the public in an outreach mode, and also at, at the same time do art with it. And so uh, my, my essential idea was simply to take the stuff that I've been working with and making for my own secretly aesthetic purposes, and just you know admit that I really am making it feel I like the look of it, and put it out there where people can see it. The science behind it has to do with a very deep idea, which is the idea of emergence or emergent forms, um, we study complex, self-organized structures, and when you study things like that, you realize that a reductionistic, mechanistic uh, way of looking at them usually doesn't work. If you divide them down to their smallest parts, the parts are really simple, and you can't deduce the, the uh, behavior of the whole from a knowledge of the parts. But you can understand it at a sort of intermediate level, so it's not amenable to a reductionistic explanation. So typically, we introduce a hierarchy of new... Uh, objects, we have technically called coherent structures, and they're larger than the parts, and they're not easy to guess from the parts, but once you have them, you, you have a language with which, which you can discuss the whole. And so, for example, this is a Brussels sprout cut in half, and if I told you everything about a cell in the Brussels sprout, everything about the DNA of the Brussels sprout, you would have a hell of a time figuring out how it's wrinkled and crinkled in there. But it, the wrinkles and crinkles are at a sort of intermediate, they're not the size of the plant, but they're not the size of the DNA of the cell either. But they're the natural language in which to discuss the mechanics of the cell. How does the little sheet wrinkle and crinkle? And those would be the coherent structures that, you know, that are appropriate to talk about this phenomenon. And then we quickly find that there's a thing called universality, and I'll show you an example in a second. And that is there are similar coherent structures across wide systems which, whose microscopic scale is not the same at all. Things that seem to have nothing to do with each other at the micro scale all look the same at the intermediate scale, at the level of the coherent structures. So the science of pattern formation is essentially to identify and to make mathematics about the coherent structures and use that to explain complex systems. That's where we're at. So a classic example of pattern formation is convection. If you take two plates and you make the bottom one hot and the top one cold, put a fluid in between them, you put a large temperature difference across, the fluid will begin to flow in a kind of series of jelly roll-like motions like this. And those things uh, can tangle themselves up. And this is actually a state of convection, which we discovered back again back in the 1990s. This paper, in which this is figure 1b, uh, basically got me my academic job. Okay, So I can't look at this with a with a sort of little <laughs> touch in my heart, because this is it. This is what got me, got me going in the field after seeing this mechanic convection. It's called spiral defect chaos, and it's a dynamic state. Um, and it's basically everything you see in here that's... Um, that's black is a cold downflowing region, and everything you see that's white is a warm upflowing region, and there's those little jelly rolls are all tangled up here. And you see this back in 1990 to make a movie like this was actually very difficult. This was made with a Next computer by pointing a video camera, a Viticon tube camera, at a Next computer screen. So this is sort of 1990s video technology. But anyway, this is what the time dependence of the thing looks like. And the state is called spiral defect chaos, and it's a state of a stripe pattern. Normally, the thing would be striped, but the stripes wind themselves up into this thing. So here's a completely different system. It's a flat, round plate covered with a bunch of grains, like sand. It's a little bit like 10 layers deep. And then I just shake the plate vertically up and down, toss the grains in the air. And if you just toss them gently, they just make a uniform popping pile. And as you toss them a bit harder, they begin to slosh around, and they make kind of stripes. And if you do it right, those stripes wind themselves up into, what do you know, the same pattern as I just showed you in the previous experiment. Now, at the micro scale, 
these two things are completely unrelated to each other. These are little grains. The other thing is a, actually a pressurized gas. But at the pattern scale, at the level of the coherent structures like spirals, um, they have very similar behavior, very similar mathematics. And you can't, I don't know about you, but I can't look at this, this sort of picture without uh, thinking of a, of a kind of fingerprint or, or, or some kind of um, abstract art. But I didn't admit to myself that for more than 20 years, and 20 years later, I had an opportunity to go into an art show, and I was kind of double dog dared by a guy who I'll introduce you to later. And I just started taking pictures that had been in my repertoire for decades, including the Smecta Convection and the Spiral Defect Chaos. And I started reproducing them huge and putting them in galleries and going into art shows with them. So here is 20 years after the original publication, is me at the, at the opening of a show called Twisted. At a project at the Project Gallery in Toronto. Project Gallery is a small independent gallery. I happen to know the guy who runs it. So here's me with my usual beer, um, just showing off my 20 year old art, 20 year old scientific piece. And here I am explaining it to some passerby. So what I don't do is I, I title it Spiral Defect Chaos, but I don't tell anybody what it is unless they ask. And if they ask, I give them a short explanation. If they ask more, I give them a longer explanation. And of course, the explanation can just grow until they become a whole physics degree, if they're willing to wait. Okay? Usually, usually people are happy with the short explanation. Some people want to go a little farther, but I've never had to give anyone a whole physics degree to understand it. But you see, it's in a conventional gallery space, and it's up to a bunch of, next to a bunch of other conventional art, which is, is on the theme of twistedness. But it took me 20 years to kind of, you know, get myself down to the point where I was sort of thinking about it the way I'd always thought about it publicly. Uh, now this is kind of my secret life being revealed. And as part of my, my crossover business, I talk to lots of art people. I have art events in my lab. I run a thing called the Art Science Salon in, at Toronto, which Rob knows about. And we introduce artists to scientists and we talk about all this stuff and they get inspired. And so this potter uh, by the name of Steve Irvine, who's a very interesting potter, saw the spiral chaos and started producing a long series of works. And this is sort of inspired by spiral chaos uh, glaze on a pot. And it also comes into a kind of craft mode. Um, this is a ski hat, which is knitted in a spiral chaos pattern. My wife also made a, a sweater. This is actually that figure, the very data that I showed you, um, transferred to a knitting pattern. And just to show you that uh, this isn't just spiral chaos, this is a a figure from another experiment. I can tell you all about the experiment, but basically this is a time-lapse movie, frames from a time-lapse movie of an injected red, blue plume which is plowing into some surrounding fluid, and it has an interesting morphology. And I worked with the graduate student Mike Rogers on this, and a few years later, I took it to the project gallery again, and there I am with my beer, as I often am. Uh, and here's, here actually is a little iPad showing the uh, chaotic movie. So it's interesting, this picture um, is, is figure 1A of a scientific publication, and I can simply blow it up and put it in a gallery, and it works. Um, and if people ask me what it is, I tell them what it is and all that. So another uh, nice demonstration is a little um, chemical experiment, a rather famous chemical reaction called the belosov zamatinsky reaction. How many people have heard of it? Wow, some people have heard of it. <laughs> Uh, poor old Belozov practically got run out of the Russian Academy when he discovered it because chemists thought that it, it, chemical reactions had to go from reactant to product without oscillating. Mm -hmm. But this one oscillates. So if you watch it in a petri dish, the petri dish, you watch it spontaneously generate little pacemakers. The pacemakers emit waves, and the waves crash into each other and annihilate. So when two waves meet, they disappear. And the whole thing is, is a subject of a massive amount of uh, research. And so I started making pictures of, of Belosov Sabatinsky and put them, putting them in galleries. Um, again, blown up really large, but without telling anybody what it, what it is. And it's a kind of circular abstract thing. Um, another standard trick, that's, I didn't invent Belosov Sabatinsky, it's well known. Even more well known is, is making sound visible by on a plate, by shaking the plate uh, with a mechanical shaker and sprinkling sand on it. This is known as a Cladney plate. It was invented by uh, one of the fathers of modern acoustics, by Ernst Cladney, as a way of visualizing sound or visualizing um, the flexural motion of a plate. And I just made a large number of rather high frequency Cladney patterns. And here they are simply arranged as by frequency. This is a very high frequency sort of screaming level uh, 
um, sound. And I, I just make a kind of six titch of these things. And this is uh, what I put in the gallery. And it's a very, it's kind of austere black and white thing. If you don't know what it is, it's kind of looks like stained glass window or something. But if you know what it is, it, it has this profound implication in terms of the, of the motion of the plate. And this is really sound being made visible. And the nice thing about this is I didn't bring it with me because it's kind of hard to carry around, but you can also do this live as a demonstration. So this is a demonstration that we might do in a physics course for students learning about the differential equations and all the physics of vibration. But you can also just do it as a performance. So here I am doing it as a performance, again, in the project gallery. And uh, if anyone wants to know what's going on, I explain it to them. But otherwise, we just look at it and listen to it. It's a terrible screaming noise. And people have their hands over their ears. And, uh, and I project it onto, this, onto the wall of the gallery. And you can, it's like a magic show. You can produce all these patterns sort of magically from this, uh, from this shaking thing. Um, you, you can also find many patterns in nature. Of course, plants and animals often have uh, very regular looking patterns. So I'm always on the lookout for natural phenomena, which I think of as being examples of pattern formation. They all have physics behind them. So phyllotaxis, for example, is the process by which plants uh, decide where to put their leaves or branches or flower petals or any of those kind of things. And the pattern of uh, kernels on a cob of corn is interesting because they're usually straight. But then you can get a little defect where they'll go into a double spiral in the middle like a pine cone, and then they come out again straight again. So this is what we call a philotactic defect. So again, I like to take this and blow it up really, really large. Everyone knows that it's corn, but for me there's this extra kind of interesting defected thing going on in the center here. Here's a gourd, uh, which inexplicably has ten fins. And each fin is paired with another fin, and even some of the fins are even bifurcating into, into the next layer of things. And so somehow the, the process of growth of the gourd you know, bifurcates successively into these fingers. And this is a very pattern formation kind of process, although we don't know why the gourd does this. It's just you know, growth. And I showed you before the Brussels sprout. What makes this interesting is that this thing actually unfurls and and you know, so somehow the plant starts all crumpled up and unfurls and makes little leaves. And the whole question of how you pack crumpled things into little volumes is a big subject in pattern formation. Buckling is the process by which you take a thin sheet or something you push together like this, or you cause it to grow fast and it will come out of the plate. It'll make a foldy pattern, or maybe it's sometimes a multiply foldy pattern. You see this on the edge of frilly leaves or flowers. All these things are mechanical buckling in the, in the usual state. So a few years ago, I kind of took the next step, um, goaded by my friend Ron, who I'll introduce in a moment, but I started putting my stuff into jury art shows, and there's a number of outdoor art shows in Toronto where you don't have to have any qualifications. You can just send pictures into the show, and if they like your pictures, you, they give you a tent. So here's a tent in a, in a park uh, called the Riverdale Art Walk, and so I put together all my images, and I put together a kind of persona um, art physics pattern formation. So anyone who came to the tent could see a sign. Maybe you can't see the sign, but the sign basically has my name and it says that this is physics. But there it is at the art show. And if anybody wants to know the physics, I tell them. If they don't, I don't care. So art, physics, pattern formation, all one thing as far as I'm concerned. And so you can actually sell. I've actually sold a few of these things. You don't really sell very much as it turns out at art shows. But uh, I have pictures that I like to talk to people about. and. And uh, you saw the spiral chaos and the cladney pattern and the bait and thoughts. And that's mud cracks. We'll come back to that. And so on. And so one of the more crazy things I did was I entered an art show called the Annex Predio Art Show. And this is kind of the high street of Toronto. is a big, busy street called Bloor Street. And there's a guy who runs around convincing uh, storefront owners to give their space on their, on their glass windows to artists for an art show on a certain weekend. So you put up little um, suction cups with hangers on them, and you hang your stuff on the, on the front of this thing, and it's a beautiful, hot, sunny day. And so here at my, my lawn chair, and something like 50,000 people go by, because it's like, you know, Fifth Avenue. It's a very busy street. So it's a kind of outdoor art show. Finally, I got together with my friend Ron, who, who was sort of uh, instrumental in fooling me into doing this, and we got uh, into a gallery called the Redhead Gallery, which is in an old... Uh, Tin Box Factory in downtown Toronto, and we had a month-long show called The Map and the Territory, 
And what Ron does is he makes uh, kind of collages, I'll show you one in a second, based on scientific images. And so we interspose my images and my uh, stuff with his, um, with his uh, collages, which are sometimes quite mathematical. So here's the plumes again, and there's some icicles. We'll come back to that. And there's Belosov Kratinsky. And so Ron, uh, here's Ron. What he did, uh, what he does is he chats up scientists and, and, and uh, mathematicians and stuff, and he gets all their images and equations, and he mashes them up into this, into this collage. So this is a collage he made out of my images. And so you can see mud cracks, and you can see Belosov Kratinsky at the top there, and all these different things that I have in my usual portfolio, and he mashes them up and makes very large uh, prints out of them. And so he and I managed to get hold of this gallery. And here's a corner of the gallery, and there's the uh, large screen TV. So we also make, I also produce videos, short videos, and put those in the gallery too. So here, for example, is a wonderful example of emergence. This is the same vertically shaping plate as before. It's kind of rectangular. And I'm laying on it two uh, chains called ball chains, and these are like the chains you might have on your light switch or maybe inside your toilet when you turn the handle. There's a, I don't know how British toilets work. It's a mystery <laughs> to me. But they're basically flexible little balls connected by sticks. And there's two of them. They're identical. One's colored blue and colored red, and I shake them up and down, and the following strange thing happens. First of all, they separate from each other, which you might not guess. Then they decide, ah, I'd much rather be spiraled. So they spiral up, and they wind themselves all up into these emergent things, which are spirals. And it turns out, we don't really understand why it happens, but this is the, the sort of favorite confirmation of, this, of the shake and chain as it finds its way into a spiral configuration, and then they have, sort of have a little dance, and eventually they get all tangled up in each other again. And so this is an example of the emergent process. You wouldn't, if I told you the experiment at the beginning, you wouldn't be able to guess where the spiral comes from. But when you see it, it's obvious. All of a sudden, there's this emergent thing called the spiral, and you can understand questions about the spiral. So here they are getting all tangled up in each other again, and then they pull apart. So we put on a long uh, set of these videos in the, in the gallery. And the great thing about galleries is that they have parties. You can, have, you can invite all your friends, and there's a social aspect to it. Um, the show, which is called Map in the Territory, that's a little bit of a joke, because the joke in physics always is that the theorists, the theoretical physicists, always confuse the map for the territory, right? They always confuse their own beautiful theory for reality. So the map and the territory. And what Ron does, he makes what he calls maps. So we think of my stuff as the territory and his stuff as the map. So the map and the territory. It turns out, of course, that there's books called The Map and the Territory, which have nothing to do with the, what we were doing in the gallery. So anyway, we had a, an opening event. And then I also had several events in the gallery where we invited artists and scientists to give talks about patterns and stuff. In the gallery, we set up chairs and had our art science salon event in the, in the gallery. Okay, so let me talk about yet another problem, another system, which is instead of taking my vertically shaking plate and putting sand on it or chains, I'll put fluid on there, uh, usually oil. It turns out that this is an experiment first done by Michael Faraday. If you shake a layer of oil up and down uh, vigorously, um, waves will start to appear on the surface, which slosh back and forth, actually at half the frequency of the shaking. That's a subtle fact. And you can actually get waves which line up in straight lines, um, looking like a series. So you shine light on it, you look at the reflected light. So here's a set of very regular looking waves. If I change the parameters a little bit, I can get a set of regular looking squares. These are like waves meeting at 90 degrees to each other. And by shaking at a lower frequency, I can get a hexagonal, kind of a beehive, honeycomb like pattern. And uh, this led to, uh, to a collaboration with uh, Rob about uh, making, uh, using these waves as part of a performance, part of a piece that he's worked, was working on. And I have a little piece of that showing it here. I guess you, maybe you've all seen this. Uh, oh, for Christ's sake. We had this done working, but then you, then we changed the setup again here. Hold on. I have to go back to the So these are Faraday waves that we made in the laboratory, and there's been some video editing.
Okay, so that's an example of a collaboration, not just me making stuff, but me making video images and sharing them with composers and working with them to produce uh, pieces based on that. Um, I mentioned several times that we work on icicles. We have a, have a major experiment on studying the morphology of icicles. People always think it's hilarious that Canadians studying icicles. <laughs> but uh, we're interested in the fact that nobody can tell you the, the shape and size of an icicle. You put in the flow rate and the temperature and stuff, and it turns out the shape and size are emergent. And even more subtle, there's actually a ripple pattern that appears on some icicles, and that's a kind of profound, uh, um, strange, uh, universal instability. All icicles have ripples of the same wavelength, no matter how they're formed. And you're going to ask, why would that be? Well, the answer is we don't know. It's still a mystery. We worked for years to work out the theory of it. But anyway, I've created enormous... I, I'm in possession of hundreds of thousands of images of icicles. And if you ever want one, you should go to something called the Icicle Atlas. And the Icicle Atlas is an open source database where all the data from the Icicle experiment to date, <laughs> over 230,000 images and hundreds of movies, including time-lapse movies like the one I just showed you, are all open source available to you. And you may know that in the science world, there is a kind of open source movement um, to, to kind of make science more public since the public is paying for it. We want to give it back to them. So this is another way that arts and science can get together, and that is that artists who are interested in some scientific topic can use the publicly available uh, content of scientific work and you know use that as input to their art. And so one person I got a, uh, into collaboration with is Jimmy LeBlanc. He's a Montreal uh, composer. And he um, and I worked together to take data from a ripply icicle. This particular icicle, we took the left-hand edge of this icicle, which, by the way, is, is run number 110, 823, if you want to look it up. Everything you ever want to know about how this icicle was formed is findable by that tag. And um, we extracted the, the shape of, the, of that edge uh, as a function of the time. And this is not slightly it's exaggerated this way, but these are the ripples that appear on the side with the baseline removed. And I supplied this to, in a, so I took the image, I ran my own Python code, and I produced a file which could be imported by MaxMSP, and he took that and he used it to create the music. And so this is, I think, a kind of raw uh, pass, where this is the, actually the, the time evolution of the ice cream growing. Each of these sonograms is a, is a successive image, and he used them to produce a um, rather complicated musical score. And then the whole thing was, was uh, played at an event in Toronto with the Continuum Contemporary Ensemble, which is a, a serious uh, group. Uh, there was a, a video also included by Farina Chanda, so it was a kind of three-way collaboration. And this is just a short piece of the video, which was just called Ice. So put yourself in my position. You worked for years to produce an icicle, and then you spend you know a little while doing software development to extract images from the icicle, and you give it to this person, and then you go to this event where all these incredibly skilled musicians play this very complex thing, which somehow is derived through this process backward through that piece of data that you took years before. It's a strange thing. By the way, just if you're really interested in icicles, I have one here. This is a 3D printed. Icicle from the Icicle Atlas. I don't remember which number it is, but you can look at it. See, those are the famous ripples that I was telling you. So we actually have a full three-dimensional data versus time of the shape of the icicle as it develops. And from that, we can do all kinds of mathematics, but we can also produce objects. So there's a, 
the three D eyes go pass around. Just don't lick it or anything like that. <laughs> okay. So finally, another musical collaboration I recently got involved with is uh, with a jazz uh, composer by the name of Quinson Nakoff, and he's a Canadian. He works in New York City, and he plays the saxophone. And he was he's interested in taking physical processes and using them as input to his his compositional process. And he asked me to. He wanted to do something kind of about cracks, and so we, a long time ago we did this experiment on the morphology of mud cracks. This is actually a little sample of mud about this big, about two millimeters deep. And I extracted from this sample, um, I just picked a random line and, and measured the width of what are called the peds, the little tiles of the mud crack pattern called peds. And I, I produced a sequence of, of numbers based on the widths of the peds. And I turn that into a Max MSP readable file, and I give it to Quinson, and he uses it as part of his process, and he ends up with a piece which actually uh, played at the Vancouver Jazz Festival last year. It's called uh, Winding Tessellations. And this is Quinson here. And this video was produced by his video artist that he works with, so it's, it's three of us in there. know that it was about cracking but so so the video you saw with the cracks built in was was post-production um, so what we're working on now and I'm meeting with Quinson next week uh, in his uh, in his uh, video the video artist he works with and the idea is to produce uh, music based on physical data but also produce back projection video for the performance so when the people, when people were present at the performance they didn't see the, the video from which the music was made but we can make a video that goes with the with the performance, and it's called Winding Tessellations, and it was played at the um, Vancouver International Jazz Festival last year. Okay, so that's what I've been doing, <laughs> and I hope to do more with uh, Rob and other people. Um, so my conclusion is that this field of pattern formation unintentionally perhaps produces stuff that can be art on its own, it can be outreach, um, you can be used as an input to the creative process to produce art by, uh, by other people. And if for nothing else, it's just interesting mix for interesting conversations. So art can be outreach, and outreach can be art. Thank you very much.